Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Frontiers in Oncology. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Tanya Gruber as our special speaker this morning. Dr. Gruber earned her MD and PhD degrees at USC. She was a resident in pediatrics and a fellow in pediatric oncology at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. And after completing her training there, she moved to St. Jude for her first faculty job. And there she uh, began her career in laboratory research in pediatric cancer, as well as clinical research and clinical care. Her laboratory at St. Jude has worked on MLL rearranged leukemias and acute megakaryoblastic leukemia. She has discovered novel fusion proteins and characterized the genomic landscape of these cancers. She is an expert on using mouse genetic models to study how these cancers work, as well as uh, xenograft models. She has screened for inhibitors and identified new candidate therapeutics for pediatric leukemia. And she is leading national clinical trials for pediatric ALL. We were thrilled that she joined us last month after winning a national search. And she is now a professor of pediatrics and she's the chief of the division of hemonc and stem cell transplant in pediatrics. She is also the director of the Bass Center for Childhood Cancer and Blood Diseases. And she is also the associate director of the Stanford Cancer Institute for Pediatric Cancer. So we are absolutely thrilled to have her here at Stanford in her new role. And I'm looking forward to working closely with her on uh, developing the pediatric cancer program. Um, her title, the title of her talk is Establishing Preeminence in Translational Pediatric Oncology, Bass Center Vision 2025. So welcome, Tanya. Thanks so much, Steve, for giving me the opportunity to present today. And I was asked to talk a little bit about myself and my vision for pediatric oncology at Stanford. And the way I've organized this talk is I'm going to start off by sharing with you some of our research efforts. And in doing so, convey to you who I am as a physician scientist and where I come from, uh, and thus sort of provide the framework uh, for my vision for the center moving forward. So I think many people know that childhood ALL is one of the ultimate success stories in pediatric oncology. Uh, and childhood ALL is defined as uh, ALL diagnosis in patients greater than one year of age, between the ages of one and 21 years. And through great uh, efforts from a lot of investigators and successive trials um, in, with that, through multiple consortiums, we've improved the outcomes for these patients significantly since 1968. And you can see here in the current era, we're reaching 90% overall survival. The clinical arena that I encompass is not quite so rosy. I focus on high-risk subtypes of pediatric acute leukemias. Uh, one of them is pediatric acute myeloid leukemia, as Steve mentioned. And there, the current uh, event-free survivals have reached about 62.7%. Um, this, these are successive St. Jude studies and results from other consortia have similar outcomes. And in addition to pediatric AML, I've also had a significant focus on infantile acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is defined as ALL uh, diagnosed in patients less than one year of age. And about 75 to 80 percent of these infants have a rearrangement in MLL or KMT2A, uh, as it's now called. And these patients comprise um, the intermediate and uh, high-risk patients designated uh, with the green um, and red uh, outcome outlines here in this um, results, event-free survival results from the Interfant 99 study, which was published in 2007. And this is a single uh, study, but what's significant about infantile ALL is the outcomes are not improving. So I can't show you a, cur a, a similar curve for infantile ALL where you see an improvement in outcomes because that simply hasn't happened. The successor Interfan 06 study was recently published and the outcome curves look exactly the same. So I've really focused a lot of my effort uh, in the laboratory and in the clinic in these diseases because these are patients that have poor outcomes and really need our attention and focus uh, to change that. 
I'm a physician scientist and I have really two components um, that, uh, of my research program. The first of which is utilizing next generation sequencing to identify uh, mutations and understand the genomic landscape of, of these malignancies with a goal of understanding the molecular pathogenesis of so-called driver mutations that are critical for the malignancy um, to uh, develop and persist. And in doing so, improve risk stratification of our patients, uh, giving high intensity chemotherapy to those patients that need it and sparing other patients who may have better outcomes from um, that intensive treatment. And of course, the goal, ultimate goal of these, this, this effort is to identify novel therapeutic targets uh, for the development of new agents. And I'm not really gonna talk about that aspect of my research program today. I will discuss it at the Cancer Center Retreat in October. Uh, but what I wanna to talk to you today about is another aspect of my research program, which looks at active agents that have been identified either in a clinical setting or through high throughput drug screening efforts, uh, looking closely to understand why we see that activity and using that information to better inform our clinical trial design. So I'm gonna talk about uh, this project that was initiated when I was about a second or third year assistant member at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And we, at that hospital, there's a lot of referrals for patients who have either failed to go into remission or have relapsed and have persistent disease despite multiple salvage attempts. And we had several infant ALL patients referred uh, to the hospital with resistant disease, and I was assigned as the primary oncologist to these patients. And uh, this study really arose from a scenario where I had put them on protocols, they didn't respond, uh, and we were really left without options. And so we started looking into what treatments could we give not on a protocol that are FDA approved, have shown activity uh, in childhood ALL, and how do the patients respond to that? And it actually developed, what was interesting is the cl this clinical observation was happening in parallel to laboratory studies, uh, and everything sort of came together very nicely in the end, ultimately leading to the design of a clinical trial, which is now actively recruiting um, at 18 institutions throughout the US and Canada. So this was the initial observation. Uh, this is three infant ALL patients uh, that I took care of in my early days as an as a assistant member at St. Jude. All three of these patients were diagnosed at a very young age, less than three months, with white counts that were very high at presentation, which is a poor prognostic indicator um, on uh, Interfant 99 and Interfant 06 um, historical studies. They all received a course of chemotherapy, uh, induction chemotherapy, and all of them failed to achieve remission. Uh, you can see here uh, after induction, these patients had persistent disease ranging from 5 to 13 percent in the bone marrow as determined by flow-based um, minimal residual disease monitoring. And so uh, their primary or their primary oncologist then referred them to us, and they were all placed on a clofarabine containing uh, protocol. That was a chemotherapy drug we were using for a lot of the uh, high risk and refractory patients uh, with ALL at St. Jude at the time. And it's a very, it's a strong chemotherapy. So when you give these clofarabine containing courses, you really wipe out the patient's marrow uh, and uh, it takes several weeks for them to recover. And it's very good at achieving remission in a fair significant proportion of childhood ALL patients. But interestingly, the infants were really not responding to it at all. So you can see pre-clofarabine uh, courses, how much disease they had in the marrow at the time they came to us. And then post-clofarabine on protocol, you can see little to no benefit. So when you have a patient that has you know, failed a ret several retrieval attempts and is not eligible for any new uh, clinical trials with investigational agents, you're really left to look at the literature and see, is there anything available that you can provide to this patient, not on a protocol? And the, uh, the TACL Consortium, which is the Therapeutic Advances in Childhood Leukemia, at the time had recently published data looking at relapsed childhood ALL at the activity of bortezomib, which is a proteasome inhibitor, in combination with multi-agent chemotherapy. 
and they had very good results. And the youngest age of the patient on that study was two years of age. So I contacted the investigators involved in the study and asked if they had given this regimen to anybody younger, and they said no. Um, but we went ahead and we tried it. And we, as you can see, while we didn't get these patients MRD negative, we saw significant responses. And this is really the first indicator I had that the proteasome inhibitor bortezomib had activity uh, in infantile acute leukemia. So we know a lot about infantile ALL uh, from work done by a lot of scientists uh, throughout the country and the world. One of them very prominent here at Stanford, uh, Michael Cleary, has really helped um, uh, us understand what's causing this disease. Uh, it is a chimeric uh, transcription factor. This fusion is a chimeric transcription factor, and it recruits transcriptional cofactors that promote elongation at target genes. One of the critical enzymes it recruits is DOT1L, which then imparts a methylation mark uh, on, at histone 3K79, and that's important for the transcriptional elongation. And so there have been various groups trying to target transcription factors associated with the ML, with the KMT2A fusion. Uh, and uh, the ones that have come to clinical trial have actually had very uh, disappointing results. So despite the promise and despite the understanding of the biology of this disease, we weren't seeing much progress in the clinic. So at St. Jude, uh, we had established uh, the Pediatric Cancer Genome Project uh, led by Jim Downing uh, and Bill Evans, who is the CEO at the time. And this effort, the goal was to really understand the genomic landscape of pediatric cancers and infantile leukemia was selected as one of those malignancies. And we were hoping to find additional cooperating mutations that could be potentially targeted therapeutically and what we found instead is actually these uh, pediatric leukemias are very simple at the genomic level in terms of mutational burden. Uh, so you can see here, I've um, arrowed uh, where the infant leukemias lie. And when you look at the burden of uh, genomic mutations across all different cancers that include adult cancers, you can see that the mutation burden is very low. Frequently, we had cases where the only genomic lesion was the KMT2A fusion gene. Uh, and so not a lot of things to target. And even in cases that had cooperating, cooperating mutations in pathways such as RAS, these tended to be subclonal often in nature. And we had several diagnostic relapse pairs where those mutations were actually lost at relapse, suggesting that they were not critical for the leukemia to persist and could easily be selected for if you were to apply um, that type of pressure by using a targeted agent. So we went back to the laboratory and we decided to do a drug screen um, using our FDA um, approved library. This was in collaboration with Chemical Biology and Therapeutics at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And we wanted to do this drug screen on primary patient specimens. And you don't really have enough of that to do a high throughput screen in the manner in which we wanted to do it, uh, simply by using uh, frozen specimens. So what we did is we took these patient specimens and we expanded them in Im Im immunodeficient mice. We, the, this then causes disease in the mice and uh, you can harvest the leukemia and use them for your in vitro studies. And this um, allows for a huge expansion so you can take a, a single patient specimen, inject a million cells and get out 10 to the eighth cells. Uh, and you can then evaluate a sensitivity to a variety of agents. So we did this with roughly 1300 uh, FDA approved drugs. And in this uh, graph, what I'm showing, what each dot represents is a different compound. And we tested the library against six different patient specimens. And the larger the circle, the greater the number of specimens the agent was active in. So drugs that were active in all six of the patient specimens um, have these uh, large red circles, and the red just indicates a low coefficient of variation. And the drugs are grouped according to class. Uh, as you go down, and what we found is that the greatest number of hits within a class of drugs was in the anti-neoplastic uh, uh, group, which is what you would expect. So as I mentioned, we screened roughly 1,300 compounds. Uh, when we filtered those down to drugs that had greater than 80% activity in five or more samples, then we were left with 172. And then we had to filter out um, compounds that really 
couldn't be used in this type of setting. So for example, there were topicals and nasal preps in our, our FDA approved library, drug library. And this left us with 59 tolerable compounds that could be administered systemically to patients. We took our top 43 candidates for a secondary validation with IC50 determination using a dose response um, as, uh, assay. And I'm listing here um, the top uh, compounds in that secondary response with the median IC50 for each of the compounds. And those values are shown here. And in red, um, I've highlighted the drugs that had activity at less than two micromolars. So this is a level or a concentration of drug that can be clinically achieved in a patient and is really the area you wanna focus on when you do this type of screening. And what was clear to us is that three classes of compounds predominated as having activity in these patients, and that included proteasome inhibitors, histone deacetylase inhibitors, and anthracyclines. And only one of this cl these classes of drugs are actually utilized in treatment for uh, infantile ALL to date, and that's the anthracycline cl class of drugs. Now, if you do a lot of drug screening, you, you know that proteasome inhibitors tend to be active regardless of what you're screening. Uh, some places use bortezomib or other proteasome inhibitors actually as positive controls. So why focus on this? How do we know this is not just a nonspecific cytotoxicity that's not gonna translate into uh, a clinical uh, signal? And one of the things that tipped us off very early on before I took care of any of those three patients that I mentioned at the beginning is that the sensitivity of our patient specimens was much greater. There was much less uh, proteasome inhibitor uh, needed in order to induce 50% uh, toxicity in our, our assays compared to childhood ALL specimens. Uh, so if you look at anthracyclines, um, three of the compounds that were evaluated, uh, you can see here our median IC50 value for the, for the infantile ALL specimens. And then these are the values that we found uh, in the literature when people had evaluated these drugs on primary childhood ALL blasts. And you can see these IC50s are really on par. Um, while we had less data with the histone deacetylase inhibitors, we saw a similar picture where we weren't really seeing greater sensitivity. But bortezomib on average needed 10 to 100 fold less drug to induce 50% toxicity in the infantile specimens compared to the childhood ALL specimens. And that suggested to us that, there may, that this may be a real signal uh, that may uh, result in a clinical benefit to our patients. And so we really uh, looked at this uh, more closely. And we, we initially did, checked a lot of um, uh, avenues in terms of why would we see this type of response in KMT 2A rearranged disease. There were papers um, in multiple myeloma showing activity was mediated by the NF-kappa-B pathway. Um, we know from Michael Cleary's work that, that pathway does play a role in KMT2A rearranged disease, but we didn't find evidence um, for that. And after a six, probably a fair number of experiments where we weren't really getting an answer, we finally hit upon a histone H2B ubiquitination. So when you treat a drug or treat a cell with a proteasome inhibitor, what happens is uh, these proteins that are marked for degradation, they're tagged with ubiquitin. And if you don't degrade those proteins, what happens is you basically deplete your ubiquitin stores within the cell. And in multiple papers from other um, groups looking at other types of malignancies, when you treat cells with a proteasome inhibitor and deplete that ubiquitin store, what happens is you get a depletion in your histone H2B ubiquitination. Um, and so this is looking at primary uh, uh, patient specimens. Um, we looked to see if we saw that depletion in our cases and our leukemia as well. Uh, and we did see depletion and it, and it varied. So what we've done in this experiment is we've treated cells with the drug, we extract histones, and then what we do is we compare the total H2B histones to the ubiquinated H2B. And below is an example of a cell line in one of our patient samples where you can see that depletion occurring over time um, and, and pretty stable within 120 minutes or two hours. So why was that interesting to us? Uh, there was a manuscript published back in 2008 that looked at the enzymatic activity of DOT1L. 
And that's the enzyme that imparts the methylation uh, mark on H3K79, which is necessary for KMT2A transcriptional elongation. And this manuscript showed very elegantly that DOT1L enzymatic activity was actually dependent uh, on H2B ubiquitination. Um, and so you can see here nice activity in the presence of uh, H2B, oops, uh, in the presence of H2B, uh, and then in the absence, you lose that enzymatic activity. And in the manuscript, by coming out from a, a totally different group, um, they did, they were looking at a KMT2A rearranged mouse model. They did a SHRNA screen in that mouse model, and one of their top hits was a gene called RNF20. And what they found is that when they knocked down RNF20, um, which is shown on the right with the DOCS um, inducible uh, system, that they significantly decreased the disease burden. They really hampered that leukemia from progressing. And what that gene does is it actually is involved in ubiquitinating H2B. So combined, uh, the data in the literature suggested that this was a critical pathway uh, for the KMT2A rearranged leukemias that you have RNF20, which is ubiquitating H2B, that mark is necessary for DOT1L to impart uh, its methylation mark on H3K79. So this then became our hypothesis that by inhibiting or depleting H2B ubiquitination, we were indirectly inhibiting uh, the KMT2A fusion. So to look at that, what we did is we treated cells and then we looked uh, at H2B ubiquitination and H3K79 methylation genome-wide by ChIP-seq, uh, doing quantitative ChIP-seq. Uh, and that's the data I'm showing you here. Um, so uh, on the left-hand side, what you're seeing is all of the KMT2A target genes as determined by ChIP-seq in the cell line. And what happens to H2B and H3K79 um, at those sites after bortezomib treatment, and what you can see is that there is a depletion um, of, that, uh, of those epigenetic marks over time. And on the top here, I'm showing you some of the favorite uh, KMT2A target genes, the Hox locus, FLT3, and MICE1, and you can see a depletion of H2B over time, uh, and that uh, also corresponds with an, H with an H3K79 depletion. And if you then look at the RNA expression uh, or expression of these target genes, we see a corresponding down regulation. Uh, and we also see a down regulation of downstream KMT2A targets, uh, such as the MYC uh, expression program, which is what you would expect, because if you're shutting down the fusion, you're going to shut down downstream pathways. And these drugs. Uh, however, do a lot. Uh, and so in no way did we uh, uh, think that this was the only reason this drug was active in this disease setting. Uh, and because uh, we were looking at something that is inhibiting proteins, we wanted to look at the proteome of our cells and what happens when we treat these cells with these inhibitors. And uh, so we, we looked at the proteome uh, in collaboration with the core at St. Jude, the proteomics core, uh, and we were, they were able to quantify uh, roughly 9,500 proteins uh, and what happens to those proteins over time as we treat them with proteasome inhibitors. And you can see a massive dysregulation in proteins with a lot of, with some proteins accumulating, as you might expect, because they're not getting degraded. But interestingly, there's a large subset of proteins where we actually decrease the concentration of those proteins. Um, and understanding that relationship is, I think, quite complex and we don't fully understand it. Um, but one of the things uh, that we found in this data uh, was confirmation of data from, that had been published by another group. And that, what that group did was they looked at proteasome inhibition and its ability to induce apoptosis and KMT2A rearranged leukemia. And what they found is that one of the proteins or many of the proteins involved in KMT2A um, transcriptional complex actually accumulate when you inhibit the proteasome. Uh, and that accumulation is actually not a good thing. So sometimes having too much of a fusion oncogene can be toxic to the cell. Uh, and in this case, they have data to suggest that that accumulation of the KMT2A fusion actually triggered apoptosis. And so we were able to confirm that the transcriptional components um, were also accumulated um, in our uh, system as well. Uh, and in addition, we found that several of the histone deacetylases were actually depleted. 
Uh, and this was uh, interesting to us because it, it was uh, similar to what was known in the multiple myeloma literature. Uh, and if you're a multiple myeloma physician, you know that proteasome inhibitors and HDAC inhibitors are two, two of the drugs that are very active in that disease and, and part of the treatment for those patients. Um, and so we took our cue from the multiple myeloma literature and said, okay, you know, we would predict that these would be very synergistic. And additionally, we had found that histone deacetylase inhibitors were active as a single agent in our drug screen. So we started to look at these drugs together in combination uh, and, and look at some of the known mechanisms of synergy and see if they were also true in our setting. And so one of the things when you inhibit uh, or, de or decrease histone deacetylase is if you then apply an HDAC inhibitor, you can increase that or you can further decrease the HDACs that are present, which increases your histone acetylation within the cell, and that can lead to death gene induction and apoptosis. And we did see that trend in our system as well. Um, wasn't so much synergistic as more additive. Um, so if we gave cells a single agent bortezomib, we saw an increase in histone acetylate, H3 acetylation, single agent brinostat, and now uh, using both drugs, uh, we see a nice additive effect. Another mechanism which has been shown is that in fact, histone deacetylases are necessary for a cell to survive uh, proteasome inhibition. So when you apply proteotoxic stress to a cell, uh, the proteins that don't get degraded can form aggregates. And uh, that agrosome formation is dependent on histone deacetylases. Uh, and what happens with the agrosomes is that they can then be autophagized and that's how the cell actually survives. So if you inhibit agrosome formation, you actually inhibit a mechanism of cell survival following a proteasome treatment. So we looked at that as well. Uh, in this experiment, we're staining agrosomes um, are stained in red. And you can see here treatment with bortezomib, you can see the agrosomes forming uh, in these infant leukemia cells. And that we, when you then add verinostat to the picture, uh, we then lose those agrosomes. And as you might expect, when we then look at in vitro uh, sensitivity uh, to bortezomib, um, and you combine it with verinostat, you can see much better um, apoptosis and killing of those cells. So um, looking here at, at um, IC50, or essentially how much bortezomib is needed to uh, induce toxicity in the cells, and you can see that in the absence of verinostat, you need more bortezomib uh, to kill the cells than if you start adding in uh, various concentrations of verinostat. And in fact, we took uh, this particular specimen um, required about three and a half nanomolars uh, for 50% kill. And when we um, uh, added in a micromolar vernistat, that, that dropped all the way to 1.5, which is a very, very uh, exquisitely low concentration in which to induce um, cytotoxicity. So this is our current working model, and um, there's some data uh, that I haven't uh, shared with you uh, for lack of time, but uh, we believe that this drug uh, has activity in the KMT2A rearranged setting for a variety of reasons, um, one of which um, I hope I've convinced you of, and that's that depleting H2B ubiquination as a result of proteasome inhibition actually impairs the transcriptional um, elongation and the transcriptional program of the fusion. Um, other groups, uh, as I mentioned, have shown that the accumulation of the KMT2A oncofusion results in it triggering apoptosis. Um, and then we also have data to suggest that in combination with histone deacetylase inhibitors, we're actually um, increasing histone acetylation um, and, and death gene in induction, as well as preventing ag agrosome formation. And in data I haven't shown, we've also um, demonstrated that similar to other malignancies, um, ER stress, uh, proteotoxic stress, occurs in this setting and is also um, playing a role in inducing apoptosis. So with all of this preclinical data, um, we got together as physicians across the country to pilot this treatment approach in newly diagnosed infants with ALL. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, a trial that's open at uh, 18 sites. My co-principal investigator is Paul Gaiman at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. And the primary objective is to determine the tolerability of incorporating bortezomib and verinostat into an ALL chemotherapy backbone um, for newly diagnosed patients. 
We have secondary objectives of um, estimating event-free and overall survival. We are not powered, however, to detect an improvement in that survival. This is really a pilot study to look at feasibility and whether or not there's a clinical signal for this treatment approach. Uh, we are also monitoring MRD and then of course comparing that uh, to the standard of care. And we had an interim analysis in March uh, of this year to look at the study results to help inform us of whether or not um, this treatment was promising and we should start thinking about planning a successor study. And uh, th these are MRD data from, from the study as of March uh, 2020. And uh, I'm actually graphing it this way so that you can see a comparison to the standard of care, which is um, Interfant 99. And uh, the way they've done this is uh, white indicates MRD negative status, so no residual disease detected. Um, and the darker you get, the more disease that's present. Um, and an Interfant 99, they're looking at MRD after a week of steroids here. The second time point is after at the end of induction, which is a six week chemotherapy course. And then the end of consolidation, which is an additional uh, chemotherapy course, which is approximately four to five weeks in duration. Uh, these are results from our study. What you can see is we're getting a significantly greater number of patients in the MRD negative state very early on. So this first time point is three weeks into therapy. Um, the second time point is the end of induction, which is uh, six weeks into therapy, equivalent to the end of induction time point on Interfant 99, and then our end of consolidation. Uh, we do have a subset of patients that have persistent disease. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're not clearing everybody, but we're getting more patients MRD negative uh, than compared to uh, historical controls. And when you limit patients to KMT 2A re-range, which is actually the majority of patients on our study, uh, that uh, trend holds true, which is very, very encouraging. And if you're a pediatric oncologist, uh, that focuses on leukemia, you do know, you are taught, however, repeatedly, that MRD is not a surrogate for outcome. Uh, and so it's important then to not get too excited about those results and look at outcome. Uh, these are our early estimates uh, with two-year event-free survival um, estimates. Average follow-up for patients that are alive is about 16 months uh, at this time point, um, with a median of 13.2 months. Uh, infant ALL patients, the vast majority relapse within a year. Uh, so typically studies report three-year event-free survival or four-year event-free survival, uh, and the curves really tend to flatten out once you hit two years. So we do think um, that these results um, are promising. Uh, and I'm showing you here uh, both overall survival in orange uh, and in the pink tone, event-free survival. This is for all patients. Uh, on study uh, and then for the KMT2A patients. And you can see that the early outcome data are very, very encouraging uh, with KMT2A patients having an estimated two-year event-free survival of 65.1%, which greatly exceeds that uh, seen in the standard of care um, on the Interfant 99 and their successor study, uh, Interfant 06, which really had no change in outcome. And what was really exciting to us is when we looked at the KMT2A re-range patients and we tried to delineate them based on uh, low, very high risk and, and so-called medium risk as Interfant likes to call them. So if you remember back from the initial slide, this is the Interfant 99 data. Um, the green and the red are the patients that have these KMT2A rearrangements. Uh, the patients that are designated as high risk have high presenting white counts and uh, very low age diagnosis. So if we use that risk stratification and we apply it to our data set, what we find is that the high risk patients, even though there's very few, they don't have this very dismal outcome uh, that was seen on the Interfan study. Uh, and the reason I think this is the case is because um, this treatment is really uh, active against KMT2A rearranged disease whether that patient has a high presenting Y count um, or a, a low presenting Y count and is older at the time of diagnosis. Uh, these drugs have activity against the leukemia that actually is driven by this particular fusion, which I think is why um, we're not seeing this discrepancy uh, in outcomes um, 
based on uh, age and white count. And that's just emphasized here again, where we're looking at presenting features at diagnosis and whether or not these patients have an event. So we can see uh, event versus no event. We didn't see a difference um, in age uh, or presenting white count. So to conclude part one, uh, repurposing drug screen um, identified proteasome inhibitors and H histone deacetylase inhibitors as active agents in KMT 2A rearranged leukemia and incorporating this into a multi-agent chemotherapy backbone for infants has been well tolerated and in term analyses suggest there is activity in this highly aggressive disease. So I hope what this has sort of shown you is, is as a physician scientist, um, where I, I sort of live in that area between the laboratory and the clinic and going back and forth. And it's really the area that I feel uh, the most passionate about. And so the question is, uh, as I'm, you know, doing all of these uh, studies and, and experiments in the laboratory, why, why come to Stanford and, and why decide to uh, lead a program at another institution? And there were really two main factors that really drew me to Stanford. The first of which was the university, which is you know, a premier university, amazing science, technology, and innovation. Uh, that's really uh, you know, second to none. And that was very attractive to be a part of that, to be uh, working with scientists at Stanford uh, alongside them, um, you know, getting them involved in pediatric oncology was something that was really attractive to me. And what was also very clear on my very first visit is that the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital uh, was committed to achieving preeminence in pediatric oncology. Uh, so over the past uh, four to five years, there's been sort of a turnover in leadership, uh, and, and they, both on the administrative side as well as um, on the academic side. And there was really, uh, with, with the new um, uh, leadership, really a push uh, to make this program one of the top programs in the country. And so when you have something exciting like an amazing university uh, with a lot of science happening and, and a facility that's committed to being a top program in the country, then it became more of a question of why wouldn't I come to Stanford? Um, and really giving me the opportunity uh, to lead a program um, in, the, in the way in which I think a top program should be led. And, and I think that's focusing on high-risk disease and bringing new treatment uh, to our patients to help cure um, all, all of the kids and not just you know, the childhood ALL patients, but everybody. So when I you know, started looking at the program, there are a couple things I learned. First of all, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital was founded in 1991. That's when I graduated from high school. So this is a young hospital. It has not been around, uh, you know, with the storied history like Children's Boston or Children's of Philadelphia. Yet despite this, uh, in the past 20 years, there's been incredible growth. Uh, and it's, it's really, um, uh, as a program, both in oncology as well as uh, across all of the divisions, really uh, started making a mark uh, in the field of pediatrics. Um, oncology uh, ranked number 16 uh, in the nation uh, this year uh, at Lucille Packard uh, in the US News and World Reports, which I think is a great achievement. And uh, the other thing that I noticed as coming into the program and learning more about it is of late there's been a huge increase in early phase studies. And I think that's a result of uh, three uh, so, sort of efforts that have um, come about, the first of which was the recruitment of Crystal Mackle, of course, who has uh, established her Center for Cancer Cell Therapy, and uh, Maria Grazia, who established the Center for Definitive and Curative Medicine. And then within oncology, Norman Lacayo has really pushed to open early phase study and has recently become the director of POETIC, which is an early phase pediatric consortium. And actually that, that consortium is now um, uh, primarily based at Stanford. And so as a result of all these um, aspects, we you, you have a program that's poised for immunotherapy, for cellular and gene editing, as well as for, as well as for small molecule and chemotherapeutics. All of these are really the necessary components for an active translational program. And I think combined with the disease expertise of our faculty, we're really poised to become a top program, a destination center for patients um, with uh, rare or high risk uh, diagnoses. 
And that was made very clear to me uh, when I, during my second visit, uh, and I was talking uh, with several investigators involved in the DIPG study. So I'm sure many of you know about this study. Uh, DIPG is a brain tumor uh, that presents in very young children, and there is no uh, treatment for this uh, diagnosis. This is a universally lethal diagnosis to have, and, and there are not survivors. And in a beautiful collaboration between Michelle Manji and neurology and Crystal Mackel in um, oncology, uh, what was revealed in preclinical studies is that the CARS, the GD2 CARS that were being developed for neuroblastoma, actually the GD2 expression was found in these um, uh, diffuse intrinsic pontine gliomas. And then in fact, this therapy was active in a murine model. And very quickly within a couple years, uh, Crystal and Michelle worked together to uh, develop a clinical trial uh, that's now open and actively recruiting. Uh, and this is involving a collaboration um, with neurosurgery, who's introducing the CARS uh, through um, intraventricularly. And then of course, uh, our critical care at um, Lucille Packard, um, who is supporting patients and, and helping them through this very intensive treatment, which is really providing them with an opportunity um, for you know, either prolongation or life or a cure. And, and as I said, there's really nothing for this, for this uh, disease. And when I was having breakfast with Jerry uh, on my second visit, um, who's the neurosurgical lead, and he was talking about the study, I got so excited. I almost wished I was a neuro-oncologist, which frankly has never happened in my life. <laughs> so uh, this was really exemplified to me what's possible at Stanford and, and the best of Stanford and what can happen when you have scientists and clinicians collaborating uh, to really change and, and, and have a paradigm shift uh, in, for a pediatric disease that's really uh, devastating. So this really uh, sort of clinched the deal uh, and I, I decided to come to Stanford and I started looking at the program closely and what aspects are already in place. And as I mentioned, there's actually incredible disease expertise and a lot of really talented individuals, things that are already here. And really, uh, it's just a matter of adding to that, adding to the great things that are already happening. Um, so when we prepared for the board this past June, uh, one of the things, the messages that um, I hope that, that I hopefully convey to them is that to have a preeminent program, first of all, you need to have a strong foundation. You need to be able to take care of patients with the spectrum of pediatric diagnoses that are seen. Um, but in addition to that, you need unique differentiators. You need uh, programs that put Stanford on the map, programs where patients are actually referred um, to Stanford to receive treatment because um, we have that unique expertise. And already existing were unique differentiators at various um, levels of development. Um, so as you know, Crystal's car uh, cancer cell therapy um, has been established now for several years. Um, one of the newer efforts um, that's just um, uh, being launched is Sherry Spunt's uh, rare sarcoma program. And uh, Alice Bertina has developed an amazing alpha beta haplo um, platform and is doing incredible things in stem cell transplant. Um, Center for Disease, um, the CDCM uh, has really fantastic gene editing studies, um, one of which um, Matt Porteous is, le is leading. So really a lot of fantastic, unique differentiators already in place. And now I'm gonna be working to uh, further increase those unique differentiators, add more of them uh, to, our, um, to, to our program uh, to, re to help um, uh, help us uh, stand out as a premier program. One of those which I'm very keen to establish and I'm working hard to recruit an investigator from MSK is cancer predisposition. Uh, I think that's incredibly important in this day and age that we um, adequately uh, identify patients that are predisposed to cancer, uh, monitor those patients and intervene early uh, as opposed to later. Uh, we're also working hard to recruit an expert in palliative care. Uh, Harvey Cohen's an amazing physician who established palliative care at Lucille Packard, uh, and we're now looking for someone to, um, for him to pass that torch on 
uh, and we have a very exciting candidate that we're hoping to recruit. And I, and I want to say that that's actually very critical because when you have a program with early phase studies and you're bringing in very high risk patients, uh, unfortunately, we're not able to cure all those patients. And so that means you need to have the supportive care in place. You need palliative care and you need psychosocial services. And so those are uh, other areas that we're looking to um, really um, um, enhance uh, at Stanford. And so how do, we, how do we get there? How do we have all of these components in place? And those unique differentiators, uh, it, you, you have the talented investigator um, who uh, is doing the hard work, but they need the support and they need uh, certain infrastructure in place in order to be successful. Uh, we need coordinators and administrative support for our clinical programs. We need centralized tissue banking and diagnostics. So when Sherry Spun brings in referrals from across the country with rare sarcomas, these are, these are cases where the, the etiology, the genomics are unknown. Um, she needs to understand what's driving this malignancy. She needs coordinators to help her bring in the cases, uh, pathology review. All of these things are necessary in order for her to impart a recommendation um, and, and to really um, uh, learn as much as we can about pediatric sar uh, rare sarcomas, uh, which can then uh, impact uh, future patients. Uh, so those things are very critical. We need a patient registry and database to support clinical and translational investigations, and we need a strong clinical trial infrastructure. Um, so below, I'm just showing you some of sort of the top programs in the country in terms of what kind of clinical trial enrollment rates do they have? And you know, there's no question that the heme malignancy program at MD Anderson is, you know, unbelievable at enrolling patients. Um, when I contacted their research coordinators, I was they quoted me 92% of their patients enroll in a therapeutic study, which is which is crazy. I mean, it's amazing. Um, St. Jude heme malignancy, very strong history of enrollment with 84%. Uh, the solid tumor service at St. Jude, about 45%. The reason that's lower is because there are less studies open. Um, when we queried some of the other programs outside of, Sa of St. Jude and in California, uh, CHL CHLA estimated 25 to 30% enrollment. So we're doing quite well at Stanford, 22% uh, when you look across the cancer center, but we need to do better. And so our minimum target uh, enrollment rate is going to be 50%, and we're going to work hard to do that. And the reason that's important, it's not just for the cancer center renewal. Patients, pediatric patients treated on clinical trials have better outcomes. Uh, and so we need the best outcomes possible for our patients. We need to be giving them state-of-the-art care. Uh, and that means in many cases enrolling them on a clinical trial. And in order to do that, we need a strong clinical trial infrastructure. Uh, and so this is Nancy Sweeters and her team. Uh, and this looks like a huge team and it is a huge team. It's an amazing team. But uh, if you look uh, to the left, um, I asked Nancy, I said, hey, Nancy, can you send me, you know, what's your clinical trial portfolio? And she sent me this spreadsheet. And I calculated in January, 163 oncology studies, 69 of them open to accrual, 22 in the pipeline. 14, that's not including Crystal's cancer uh, cellular therapeutics program, which had 14 studies, uh, five open to accrual at the time, seven in the pipeline. Now these numbers have shifted, you know, we're now uh, in September, but that just gives you sort of a, an idea of the number of studies that Nancy and her team have opened. Uh, and so you might say, well, why do we need so many studies? Pediatric oncology has a lot of patients with rare diagnoses. Um, we're starting to open up studies with um, uh, early phase targeted therapies, um, and targeted therapies aren't going to be active against all malignancies, right? And so in order to have the portfolio of trials that our patients need, we have to open a lot of studies. And then, you know, the, the, in order to, you know, have the patients treated on these studies, we need that clinical trial support. So actually right now, as, as amazing as this team is, it's not enough. We actually need to build up our infrastructure and have more um, uh, 
uh, individuals helping helping and, and being part of Nancy's team because currently we're actually limited in how many additional trials we can open. So we, we need to actually work really hard to increase this infrastructure even further. And so uh, looking forward, uh, key initiatives for the first five years are going to be uh, faculty recruitment. Um, we have a couple areas where we're actually short staffed uh, in terms of clinical coverage. Uh, and we also want to recruit physician scientists and clinical investigators uh, that are going to sort of have that vision for the next uh, generation of therapies and bring that uh, translational aspect to our center, um, which is already, frankly, very strong in translational research. Uh, and in order to do that, we're going to need clinical trial infrastructure uh, and diagnostics are going to be critical. Um, and so those are sort of the three key areas that I've identified for the first five years. And the only way this is going to be done is through a partnership uh, with Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. They're supporting a huge amount of uh, Nancy Sweeter's uh, team financially. Uh, and then the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health for Children's Health, which is the fundraising uh, organization. Um, and really without them, th none of this would be possible. Uh, and so I'm really grateful uh, for their collaboration and support. And so just to conclude, uh, overall goal is to strengthen foundational programs and advance our differentiators. We should capitalize on the science at Stanford to build a preeminent translational program. Clinical trial infrastructure and diagnostics are key supportive requirements for our clinical programs. And we need to work to retain our existing and uh, talented clinicians and physician scientists, as well as recruit additional um, uh, uh, individuals. And then partnership with Lucille Packard Children's Hospital and the Lucille Packard Foundation uh, in order to achieve these goals. And so I'll end there. I have to, of course, uh, thank uh, uh, my past and my future, uh, so uh, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, um, everybody in my laboratory, both alumni and current members, three people were brave enough to come with me uh, here to Stanford, which I'm so grateful for. Uh, really uh, fantastic individuals have, uh, have uh, uh, joined this effort with me to come here. Uh, of course, the teeny consortium of investigators for my infant ALL trial uh, would not be possible to translate my findings with a single institution study. So that collaboration is uh, very, very important to me. And then uh, Mary Leonard, Paul Fisher, and Steve Artandi, who worked hard to recruit me here. Uh, Paul Fisher was particularly persuasive on the phone. Uh, so he uh, should be given some credit for getting me to even come for a first interview, which I initially declined. Um, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, the foundation, the entire division of hematology, oncology, stem cell transplant, and regenerative medicine, uh, as we're now called, uh, one unified family. And in particular, Alice Bertina and Robertson, uh, Robbie Parkman, uh, they really, the merger of the divisions was uh, not an easy thing to do, and they really worked hard to help this be smooth. And Alice Bertina is our, our new section head for stem cell transplant, and, and she has her own vision for transplant, which is uh, amazing, and I can't wait to see that program grow under her leadership. And I'll stop there. Well, thank you, Tanya, for uh, an amazing uh, overview of not only your science, uh, but also your, your vision for where we can take pediatric cancer at Stanford. It's very inspiring on both fronts. Um, please, uh, those of you who would like to ask a question, please enter it in the Q&A chat on the bottom of your screen. We, have, we still have a few minutes for questions. I'm sure there are many in the audience. We had a terrific turnout here um, on Zoom and probably more on Facebook Live. So there's a ton of interest in, in what you're doing, Tanya. Um, I just wanted to start by, by saying, first of all, I'm, I'm so impressed by your molecular focus on pediatric leukemia and then being able to translate that from, you know, from the preclinical. Um, it's really impressive and I think it's a, it's a model for how many of us at Stanford can uh, view the future of oncology broadly. Um, and then I wanted to ask you if I got this right in your talk that the bortezomib and the verinostat work, once you did the preclinical work, you went directly to a first line ALL trial. And I was so 
stunned by that. You kind of just glossed over it because in the adult world, this would be in relapse patients. We'd be looking for signal. I mean, safety, of course, first, but also signal of activity. Yeah. So, you, so, I mean, there must I, be relapse kids because it's, it's a terrible disease. So I just wonder, yes. how, does, how does that work? So I didn't have time to present all the data and uh, we did look in the relapse setting. So um, that preclinical work is uh, undergoing hopefully a final revision for publication and we include data in um, relapse patients. Uh, so in the relapse setting, uh, what we it's a small number. Uh, so you can imagine a rare disease and then you're looking for relapse patients with that disease. We treated 10 KMT2A rearranged patients uh, and found a, a roughly 80 to 90 percent response rate. Um, and so with that small number of patients, because the prognosis was so dismal, um, the investigators um, that I work with felt that it was sufficient to proceed forward in a pilot a clinical trial for newly diagnosed patients. Now, my other argument would be, uh, you know, another study ongoing uh, looking at DNA methyltransferase inhibitors uh, really had no clinical, preclinical, you know, no data in relapse setting that it was going to be active at all. And the problem is when you have infant ALL patients, they're not eligible for the majority of the relapse studies. Uh, and that can either be because uh, the new drug has a tablet form, there's no suspension formulation. Um, in general, most relapse studies exclude patients less than a year of age. So to get relapse data is very difficult. And it's really been a huge um, impairment and progressing outcomes for these patients. Uh, so one of the things I constantly advocate for is when you open a relapse study, please do not exclude patients less than a year of age in pediatric mm -hmm. oncology, and also working with pharma to help develop these suspensions which are necessary to get the drugs to the patients. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, we have some questions now. Um, Edwin Chang asked, is there a circulating biomarker that tracks ubiquitination with therapy? Yeah, that's a good question. So on our study, one of our correlative studies is uh, to obtain specimens. Um, we're, we're actually tracking, we have time points um, before exposure to bortezomib and varinostat, and then within six hours, and then uh, we have another four-day time point. And uh, I don't know of a circulating biomarker, um, but we're certainly obtaining specimens from the patients to look at those cells and see what's happening um, at those time points in, in the patients. Great, thank you. And Crystal uh, says, so excited to see your vision, Tanya, looking forward to working with you to execute it. The data in infant ALL looks very exciting. I wanted to ask about the activity of your proteasome inhibitor, HDAC inhibitor combination in non-infant KM2A leukemia is. Yeah. So, yeah. so when we looked uh, at the relapse patients that I was mentioning, actually several of them were not uh, pediatric or not infants, they were older. So we've treated a couple uh, older patients. Um, and that relapse data, what, what I haven't mentioned is it was actually a mixture of ALL uh, mixed lineage and AML patients. Uh, so the only requirement for the treatment regimen was that they have a KMT2A rearrangement. And we saw activity across the board. Um, and so it, it's an intensive, so in the relapse setting, when you've got someone who comes to you with KMT2A rearranged disease, typically their oncologist has tried several salvage attempts and they failed three or four. So they're very fragile and it's a relatively intensive treatment. And what I can say is that the older kids who can complain are complaining a lot about the side effects. So there was a patient at Rady uh, who uh, got this treatment off, you know, off protocol. Um, I'm friends with the oncologist with secondary AML, KMT2A range. She was a teenager and she had a, a prior, a primary malignancy of Ewing's. And she told my friend that it was the worst keep she'd ever gotten in her life <laughs> because wow. she just felt tired and wiped out. The infants tolerate it much better. Uh, and whether that's because, you know, they can't complain, you know, they're young, <laughs> or whether uh, they have truly fewer side effects is really difficult to ascertain. Um, but it is active in older kids. Uh, 
it's intense. Uh, so typically when I'm approached by physicians, I tell them, let's, let's try the standard things first. And if you've got someone in good condition and there's no other options left, left I would give it a go. Uh, thank you. Michelle Manje uh, says, beautiful talk. Thank you for laying out this exciting vision for pediatric oncology. Can you speak to the importance of national collaborative trials in pediatric oncology? And how can we increase Stanford engagement in national collaborative trials? Perhaps this comes back to building infrastructure. Yeah, so there are a lot of collaborative groups in pediatrics. Um, there's, of course, uh, the big mothership, uh, the children's oncology group, and then there are smaller groups uh, that tend to focus on different things like the, the Brain Tumor Consortium, there's a NIANT for neuroblastoma, and leukemia has a couple. And I think it's really critical that we participate because so many of our diagnoses are rare. Um, and so you have to be able to uh, you know, work with a lot of different people and participate in a lot of consortiums. And I think that's important, not restrict yourself just to COG studies or we only participate in poetic studies, um, but really look at what are the studies that are open and are those beneficial for our patients and opening those that are. Uh, and, and I think when you do that and you have relationships with, with many individuals, then, then they're, they're receptive to you. Um, and when it comes time to you know, transferring your single investigator, single site investigator initiated studies and you're ready for a consortium, that's the only place you're gonna get the numbers up to actually show a benefit and outcome. So we have to have that relationship to translate single institution studies to a larger audience. Uh, and it's gonna be very important that we build that and uh, build it with all of them and not um, you know, focus on one or two. Thank you. And then we're out of time, but maybe you could give two quick answers to the two remaining questions. One is uh, from Kara Davis, and she says, beautiful talk, Tanya. Any ideas about mechanisms of failure for babies who didn't respond to the HDAC proteasome inhibitors? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so when patients relapse, of course, on our protocol, we have it written in to obtain specimens, and we're very interested in looking at pre and post. Uh, and I'll be very honest with you, Kara. Um, I don't fully understand. What I can tell you is that um, the patients that have minimal residual disease after the induction therapy, those are patients that we are the ones that relapse. Um, and so there's a, a sort of upfront resistance to apoptosis in that setting, um, as opposed to development of resistance, in my opinion, just you know, because that's the trend we're seeing. And so I, ne I need to study that and look at that further. And the final question is one about training and education. It's from Raul Montiel, who says, thank you for sharing your vision. Welcome. Very excited for what's to come at Stanford with you on board. What is your vision for the fellowship program? So the fellowship program is very, very important. I mean, you know, that's the new talent. Uh, and we want to make sure that we have, you know, bright fellows and, and, and fellows that we want to retain as faculty. Um, and so, I really feel that the top programs in the country have outstanding fellowships. And uh, so we, we have a huge emphasis on the fellowship program moving forward. Um, you know, I, I spoke to the fellowship, Michael Jang is our fellowship director, um, and I'm gonna be interviewing every single candidate that comes through um, and working really hard uh, to, you know, work with the faculty and get outstanding mentorship so that we can train uh, the next leaders in oncology. Really important, the fellowship, absolutely. And the other thing I just wanna say is, I'm really interested in getting those fellows out into the university at, at some of these amazing laboratories. Um, and, th and that's gonna be important. Sometimes you tend to see fellows going into sort of the same few laboratories. And we really need to open up the university to them, introduce them to all the amazing opportunities uh, so that they can um, uh, you know, gain what, what Stanford has to offer. I mean, that's why you come here for fellowship. And in my opinion, is you wanna do amazing research with an amazing investigator. Uh, and, and, and then also, you know, to get great clinical training. So I think we can, we can do that. That's great. Well, I think we're out of time, but Tanya, thank you for a wonderful seminar. Welcome to Stanford. Thank you. Uh, we're so excited to have you and we're looking forward to working closely with you in, in the coming weeks and months and years. Thanks and, so much. Um, great to see you. Thank you.